and no one would be any the wiser. Like who would know there's an error? But there's so much copying of stuff these days. And like, I mean, it's, it's probably pretty easy just to go and trace somebody else's. What do you know if it's good or not? So that's the whole thing. I'm your host, Brian McCann, and this is the Road to Wine Expert Podcast. The wine world can be a scary, overwhelming, complicated place. And it's really important to have some sense of where you're going or what you're looking at. And if you're on any journey, right, you need a really good map. And today's guest does exactly that. Steve DeLong is the maker of some of the finest maps in the wine industry today. But I actually did not meet Steve thanks to his wine maps. I actually first found out about Steve because of his wine tasting notebook. When I was starting out in wine and before I learned about the systematic approach to tasting wine through WSET and deductive tasting through the Court of Master Sommeliers, uh, I picked up Steve's wine tasting notebook on Amazon because I thought it looked good. I thought it looked concise. I liked its slim profile. And I really didn't know much more about it than that. And so it served as this entry level point to keeping track of what I was drinking. And while I was working in wine retail and I was tasting 30 wines every month plus wines at events and other in-store tastings and doing my own research and sort of building this wine knowledge, I needed a place to keep it. And so the tasting notebook was the perfect place for me to start tracking all of the sensations and experiences and aromas of tasting wine. And so that led me to my interview with Steve, where we talk about how he got into winemaking. And we also talk about his periodic table of wine, which has been featured in a lot of different places. Uh, It's known more properly as the wine grape varietal table. And the story, how it comes about, is really interesting too. So please enjoy my interview with Steve DeLong and learn about his process and how he came up with some amazing maps, and the amazing wine grape varietal table, which is just so easy to say, just rolls off the tongue naturally. I don't think there was any revelation. I think people have these these stories, like there was this, um, whatever, they had this, what, Chateau Margot 1962, and then they had an epiphany and whatever. <laughs> Things started, you know, but that's that's not for me. It's like it, it just gradually happened. I grew up in, I was born in Chicago, but I grew up in Oregon wine country, and uh, it was just around everywhere. And I think it was my preferred drink. So when I started drinking, I'd rather have wine than beer or something else. And uh, it just progressed from there. I think when I when I went my wife Deborah a much later than that um she was really into wine and so we both sort of went on the same path. So you meet your wife, you both have wine as sort of a passion and then what when do you do de- what do you develop first in sort of your arsenal of tools you've got you know your tasting notes, you've got the periodic table of wine or the wine grape varietal table um is your background as an artist or how do all those things gel together well my background is as an architect so okay kind of kind of an artist but uh not really and uh i uh it's actually was deborah's idea with for the wine grape varietal table and she said oh we can do this periodic table of wine grapes we went to this one bar in New York, she does this great periodic table on the wall. So we had this, this this huge old like thing from a schoolhouse, and it was uh, it was really cool. And that at the bar they had this thing with, where it was if it was your name on that day you could drink for free the whole day. And they had Steve, and for this like 
they never had Steve because it was like the most common name at the time, but it's not very common anymore. But uh, uh, we didn't drink the whole night there for free, but still it was like, he's like, okay, this must be some sort of sign that we uh, should do this. And so we just started putting together with little post-it notes on the wall with great varieties, little, just tons and tons of research and came out with the first edition that was probably not that great, but uh, um, it, there was a lot of interest in it. So he said, okay, let's just make it better. Make it, let's go for a second edition and do it much more seriously and, and um, get into the research in depth. And, and so it became what it is and uh, just sort of in the evenings while we're working. So it was just, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like a big business idea or something. It's just something. And uh, it was a lot of fun to do. So is that really, did that force you to spend a lot of time learning about the intricacies of wine and, and the details? And before then, were you just sort of a, a casual wine drinker? Yeah, we, we had we'd done a, a class with w, uh, WSET, um, advanced class, not a diploma, and that was that was good. But it was it was much more in depth. Doing I think doing your own research is uh, is when you have to know the answer to something, you really really have to focus on it. it really really takes a lot of work, and it's it's just it's beyond what you'd have to do for any sort of class. So. Right. So what was, what were some of the big um, missing elements from that you added in version two of the periodic table? Once you finished your product and you thought you were sort of done, right? What did you, what sort of moments did you say like, Oh wow, we totally missed out on this. Well, there's some things like uh, organize things by acidity was one thing we didn't do before. And um, added a bunch of grape varieties that we just missed. Um, there's a lot more that we have to add. And so there's another version that we 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 sort of have waiting in the wings to get out, but it it's it's difficult because it's there are so many more grapes that should be added. There's 184 on it now and probably needs to double. Um, so or at least gain another hundred grapes. So that's a, so every, all the little cells get to be really tiny and maybe it doesn't look so much like a periodic table anymore, but. Um, yeah, that was going to be my next question is you know, when you get to the point of now edition three and potentially four, does it make you know, sense to use the periodic table or we have to develop sort of a different um, structure maybe to organize all the grapes. Yeah, might, there might be have to be something completely different. I mean, it's not exactly like a periodic table, but uh, it's sort of its own little thing with a bunch of cells. And um, yeah, it'll definitely have to change. There's one one thing we want to change is the the name of varietal because that is such a a weird word and. Um, <laughs> It confuses so many people, and it's not, like we, we, when we first started, we should call it the variety table or the varietal table. And we said, okay, varietal is an adjective, so it describes a table, and um, and that was our, our reasoning. But then people always call grape varieties grape varietals, and it's not really not really the right uh, word. So we probably should go back to calling a grape variety table. Um, the British are really crazy about this. Like Jancis Robbins just goes, oh, you can't call it a varietal. It's not a varietal, it's a variety. And, um, but I think Robert Parker is the guy that really started saying varietal. And so Americans just say varietal, but not all Americans. But Interesting. I did not even know the, that nature of, of the word and sort of how it's been, uh, used by different people and now we've yeah, got two it's, schools it's, of thought. I didn't realize there was such a, a division in, in terms of pronunciation. Yeah, I just, I got that from people and 
just by name because yeah i asked lots of people and a lot of people go i don't who cares you know, I guess it's called variety varietal. It doesn't really matter. But then you get, then you call it something, and then people are saying like, "Oh, it's not a variety. What's that?" You know, like, and there's a lot of snobbery saying like, "That's just completely incorrect." So total fail. But, <laughs> but that's the way the wine world works. There's, a, there's this, you know, people say there's no snobbery or whatever, but there, there is a lot. Oh, like, it's late for- snobbery. Yeah, it's rampant. Once you're here, you, you can't help but find it. But that's what we're trying to dispel and, you know, separate ourselves from. from yeah, that. but it's as fun. Much as you can. You can, but it, it is fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think if it didn't exist, then it wouldn't be as fun. But yeah, it's good to have tension, right? It's good to consider yourself like an outsider. Oh, I'm not with those guys. Uh, I'm one of the, it's like being the cool dad, right? Like, oh, I'm the cool dad. Like you guys can right, yeah. hang out and, and party in the basement. <laughs> right. Right. Which is totally uncool. Yeah, that's like <laughs> right. the, least, the least cool thing you could do. Yeah. You know, when you're like cut off Motley Crue t-shirt, you know, chain smoking upstairs. Like, oh yeah, you guys can hang out. Uh, I'm probably dating myself with that. <laughs> so be it. Uh, so you produced the wine grape varietal table. I'll use that uh, naming structure. And then did you have it? Did you have it in mind? You know, you're going to sell this thing or was it really just sort of a passion project? Uh, how did, how did you ever think, did you think about the end game of like, Oh, now that we've made this, are people going to buy it? How are we going to sell it? No, it's sort of like, oh yeah, we can start this uh, publication and just do that and um, have, it, it was going to be three products to start with that, that table, then there was going to be the wine map of the world and the um, anatomy of a taste. And so what happened is the, the wine map of the world became just wine maps because I, because uh, when I got into looking at wine maps, there were, uh, the interesting thing you thought like, oh, this has already been done. It's already been covered easily. And it's like the 2005 or something. And then really getting into it, it's like, wow, really hasn't been done that well. And it hasn't been done comprehensively at all. Like there was the wine atlas of the world, but that would have little snapshots of, of wine regions. Or, I mean, France has been really, completely well covered because they have a company, Benoit, who's a really great wine map company. But for the rest of the world, very, very little. Um, Italy hadn't even had a map. Like Burton Anderson was a guy who did a, a, a wine uh, atlas in the 90s, which was completely out of date with lots of errors and weird graphics where you couldn't really tell the, the boundaries and the roads so it was like and it resulted in lots of errors where people because people just copy this stuff they don't really go for the source material so they would like a lot of publications had half of sicily covered by um marsala and it's like just because you could see on the burton anderson map the road was and the and the border of the wine region looked the same, so you couldn't really tell where it ended. And so people just had to, this this mistake just was rubber stamped over and over and over again. So it's like, okay, so like just make it like go to the source material. It took a long time to do something like the Italy map, but um, just that's that's it. Just started with actually with a Spanish map, California map. Italian map, um, and just so we're almost done with twelve maps, and that's going to be the end. <laughs> and the and then do lots of regional maps because we have so much information on regions. Um, so that was the that was the, going to be the wine map of the world. But then it went on to just a bunch of wine regular wine maps and uh, the. Anatomy of a Taste became the the tasting notebooks. Mm. So, so I thought like, okay. So instead of making a big chart on what goes into a taste, just have a sort of thing. It, 
like a professional tasting, but in a, like there were lots and lots of different formats of tasting charts and tasting um, uh, forms and just try to make one that's like a, a really good but serious one. And that was the, the wine tasting notebook that you see. That's, um, so it's a, it, it has its, its limitations, but um, that's about as, as good as you can get. So when you set off and you sort of said that the periodic table was a, a nighttime project. Now, is this what you do full time? You mentioned you're an architect or is this, you know, the, are the maps and the tasting notes and the grape varietal table? Now, I'm going to pause every time I say that. Um, are those... Are those your full time gig? Are you uh, are you totally in the wine industry, or is this still a, a no? Passion? Now it is. Yeah. Okay. No, it's 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 transitional. I think that's a good thing to do. Is to um, like people say, oh, you should just draw into a business, and but this yeah. is the kind of business. This isn't the kind of business that you would get, and this isn't Facebook. You know, <laughs> um, you're not going to get a huge inv investment for a wine map business, so you kind of have to self finance it. Absolutely. I think that's good advice. Anytime you take on a new endeavor. I mean, one of the great things though, is like when you do start a project, you have that momentum and excitement and you really need to ride that wave for as long no, as that's possible. Right. Yeah. No, that's um, but you know, that fades. And so it's nice if you're only blocking, you know, two to four hours a night or something like that on a project because early on, right. You're just like, Oh, I can't wait to get home and, and do this and do this. And then yeah. I'm sure when you got into something as deep and complicated as the grape varietal table, you're probably at one point, you know, it's exciting. You're doing this research and then it probably becomes daunting when you're just, how, how many more grapes do I have to do? You know, how, how much yeah. more work is there? I've never heard of these, you know, which ones yeah. do we leave in? Which ones do we take out? Yeah, and then proofreading stuff like that. I think it's like it's torture. It takes like a week to proofread, and and that's why like maps we get that like you get information and you actually have to proofread the map because you're relying on on data feeds for things just like city names and some of them can be completely wrong. And you're like oh, and then people point that out and um, you just feel like you're stupid or something, but. Well, and, and you don't print, I'm sure, uh, one copy at a time. Uh, you probably scale up to uh, to make some kind of profit with your business. So it's not like, oh, we'll we'll just get it on the next one, or we could go in and, and fix it digitally. No, that's it. No, it's our uh, we we printed a California map, and we had some uh, we had a town spelled wrong. It was unbelievable, and we pulped up twenty five hundred to just for that mistake. So, yeah, but you have to do it. But now they're collector's items, right? Like all those, you know, like weird, you know, misspelled names on baseball cards or things like right. that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> now there's all these, you know, that the wine map geeks, you know, the real, the real nerds, they're, they're trading in that. Like, oh, do you have the, do you have the DeLong, California map with the misspelling of whatever town it was? And then, yeah, oh, I've got I've got two copies. Uh, um, yeah, that would yeah that'd be big. No, I don't think so. But um, <laughs> we have had the um, the great varietal table counterfeited and sold on Amazon. Oh, and there was this blurry copy. It was getting all these bad reviews, and it's this is terrible. It's you know bad quality and all of that stuff and. I mean, a lot of the Amazon reviews are like slow delivery. I hate this product, you know. So, but the um, the uh, it was it was it was being counterfeited, which is amazing. I think that's really um, I was really flattered by the whole thing. Yeah, if someone was just taking the trouble to photocopy it and yeah. provide poor customer service, that's right. high praise. Yeah, you you made it. I know. <laughs> I mean, we've been also been in a few cop shows as a um, background pr prop. And it's funny because it's always the bad guy. <laughs> one was for a serial killer. Um, and one was just uh, 
Patriot Day, is sort of the Marky Mark uh, mm. movie that just came out. I haven't seen the movie, but it supposedly was supposed to be a prop in that. Okay. I had to sign a little waiver. Pretty, huh. pretty exciting. That is exciting. About I, as exciting as it gets for us. But I first discovered your uh, the periodic table uh, at a wine shop I worked at. And it just so happened I was stacking, I was moving boxes from one side of our tasting room to the other side because uh, we were having a big tasting. And I like unearthed this map behind the stack of boxes and I was like, or the table rather. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I didn't know this thing was here. And this is, I had already had the notebook and then I didn't even put together that it was the same uh, you know, author and that was all connected. So it all, it all came together and wow. researching and reaching out. It's like an archeological it. dig. <laughs> it was, there was some old wine there that needed to be moved some rosé from the previous vintage that we had not sold through. So he had to shift it and get it to the That's floor. That's old. <laughs> yeah. That, that old rosé, <laughs> the 15. Um, so that was very cool. So, you kind of did it by yourself, really. What, so what resources, you know, you talked a lot about getting like the, going to the source material. So how'd you go about finding some of that stuff? Uh, Cause like you said, there's sort of a lot of books out there, but what, what became like really reliable information for you as you were building your maps? Oh, for maps, it's definitely it's the government documents. Okay. And they're different. They're different. There's lots of different things. Like the, the uh, it's it's like they're legal documents, and they usually don't have maps um, attached to them. It's kind of like a property survey, where it'll be described like go to this corner, to that corner, to this corner, to that corner, and that's the definition of the thing. And so the Italian one was very difficult because there were maps somewhere. Like some, somebody would make their map of Sorin, the Sorrentine Peninsula or something like that. Like, but it's a specific area in the Sorrentine Peninsula. So like, but if you go there, you can't get anyone to give you the map. But it is laid out in, a, in, a, in, a, in text. And so you just have to plot it out. And there's every region's like that. So... It's like 400 different regions plotted out that way in Italian. And I don't speak Italian, so it would have to be translated by someone or Google Translate. I mean, the simple ones are easy, but some, some just definitely had to be translated. And, um, and they use the, the military maps. So it's like, it's, 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 it's tricky, but, um, no, it, it takes and it takes a lot of time and if that's the ones that actually are documented and some are very casual like doing New Zealand it's all it's just it the, the definitions are so vague like Marlborough is the entire province of Marlborough and um, Canterbury is the entire thing and they're all these just chunks they're just dividing up the islands the southern island northern island and just meaningless so you have to show where the vineyards are and do a lot of research a lot, a lot of uh, satellite um, pictures to see where the vineyards are and stuff like that and that those are much more difficult um, South America is the same way uh, Argentina is not documented well at all the Argentinian wines of Argentina do make some maps but they're um, just preposterous so so has technology helped you a lot in facilitating getting the information because i imagine as you said in 05 when you started uh you're probably left doing phone calls maybe some email and probably physically going to the place but now with google maps and google earth email and all these other ways to connect has it become easier oh and then i guess you can also like scan and send documents too so has it been easier now as you sort of continually 
go out and create new maps? Are those easier? Are those more difficult? Or what's, what's the state of the map world as, as you see it? Um, no, there, it's, it definitely is much more easy to make a map. But the, uh, it does, it's funny because like going to places, it sounds romantic. And it's like, that's the way that you'd love to, to do it. But um, it doesn't help at all. Because it's the view from you know ten thousand feet. When you're on the ground, you can't see anything. So it's and and it's hard to to find the people who ha actually have the 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 information. But um, yeah, like South Africa actually is a fairly easy map to do uh, that we just finished. And um, there were a few questions on new wine regions and. Uh, just send an email and boom, response right away. It's like, okay, that's too easy. And so that map's done. Um, yeah, so I'm working now on Austria and Hungary. Austria is very easy. Hungary is actually very easy as well. It's very well documented. And, um, but the, the neighboring regions aren't so much like uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia. And so, I'm not getting good responses from them, but I have to sort of just figure out how to, how to proceed there. Do people ever look at you? Like I imagine it's you're sort of really like diving in and, you know, maybe you're at the town hall or whatever government entity and you're trying to find maps. Do people ever look at you like this is the craziest endeavor they've ever heard? I'm like, why, why do you want to make a map? Like the wine is right here. You know, what do you need a map for? Do you yeah, get a lot well, of it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's the whole thing. Is the amazing thing we sell tons of these maps, and it's like, and if if starting out, I would not think there was a market for this. I say no, but of course, it's like I would I would buy them. So I, I bought wine maps, a lot of crappy wine maps, and and so now hopefully they're better now. But uh, uh, I wouldn't imagine, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people would be buying wine maps, but they are. Especially Good. in the days of Google Maps and stuff like that. It is it is sort of bizarre that even in this day and age, like even just having Google and being someone who's curious about a region, just how many like bad maps there are or incomplete or contradictory. You know, if you just do like your Google image search and you're like Loire Valley wine map. And you just look at it, you're like, well, this is here, this is there, this, you know, they're just, no one's really figured out, well, maybe you have. Uh, but it's, it is a, an interesting phenomenon that even with all this technology, we're, you still have to go back to the source and you're really rebuilding essentially these maps from scratch. Yeah, no, that's, that's the way to do it. Because it's, it's funny because there's so many... Um, you can, it's like even Benoit, who's the wine map producer, the, the premier wine map producer of France, they had their, uh, their overall map of France was terrible. I was wondering why it wasn't, and there were, there were errors in it. And uh, just wondering, I had no idea why, but well, maybe they're trying to catch somebody if they copy it or, but you see the errors copied over and over again. And um, and no one would be any the wiser. Like who would know? There's an error. But there's so much copying of stuff these days, and like I mean, it's, it's probably pretty easy just to go and trace somebody else's. But do you know if it's good or not? So that's the whole thing. Interesting. Um, what sources did you use, and are you using now for? Uh, the great varietal table. I have like every wine book practically. I have more wine books than than uh, than bottles of wine, which is sad. That's like that was um, that was uh, like Randall Graham's definition of wine geekiness. If you have more wine books than than bottles of wine, you're pretty pathetic and you're an entrenched wine geek. So yeah, so I just that's it just skimming through all of those things and um there's another project that i have to get working on um 
which is a, a, a history of food pairing, mm-hmm. which is, it's a big subject for most people that aren't interested in wine, wine and food pairing, um, that most things do go together. And, uh, but there are, there are some like classic wine and food pairings that, that you wonder about what is the history behind it. So it's more about the history of that. So I have these tons and tons of wine books trying to get through the history of all these different pairings. And, um, you have to read a lot of slug through a lot of stuff that's just irrelevant and boring. And so, will that book be written, or you do you plan to sort of create a, a visual interpretation of these pairings, or what? What? Or is that still something TBD? It's, it's it's half. It's like it's half written. It's um, or maybe a quarter written. Uh, it's been completely illustrated by my father-in-law, so I have to finish it because he's he's going. When's it? When's it? When's it going to be done? Okay. So, so as a, as a self-made, you know, wine expert and now an authority on maps and regions and things like that, what, what advice would you give to people who are looking to sort of level up their wine knowledge and, and maybe they have an idea for similar to you. They're trying to scratch their own itch and say, you know, this doesn't exist in the wine world. I want to go about creating it. Right. Would, what would you say to those people? I guess if you're starting out, I think the, the, the main thing to do is to be a good listener. And because uh, if you like talk about like being a wine taster, oh, they've got a great palate. And it's like this, almost it's like an athletic skill. And that is complete nonsense. And um, it's, it's to be a really good listener is to be a good taster. And, and to develop that knowledge over time and there's nothing that it's going to take a lot of time and just sort of embrace it embrace the the whole thing and not be so insecure that you have to be like oh i know that no you know it's like yeah so what would be like a little stupid things like whatever it is like the difference between bordeaux and burgundy and um which chateau is which and all of that and um i know i i got it fell into that i think it's like if you don't want to look like an idiot or but it doesn't matter it just doesn't matter it's like so i think the whole thing is to be a good listener and that's the um which sounds pretty wimpy but uh well it's a lost art i think so many people want to just talk and talk and especially in wine i think we're also eager to share the newest coolest thing we just read about and a blog post or from producer, you know, we're always just swapping stories, but rather than, you know, just sitting back and waiting for the pause to tell your story, just really absorb, I think is, is the best way to, to get knowledge for sure. And there's so many people who, if you're just starting out, know so much more than you have spent so much more time learning uh, and, and trying and tasting uh, and there's so much more world experience that you, you're better off just sitting back and absorbing and, and really listening, like actively listening and, and hoping some of it right. sticks. No, because, yeah, actively listening is difficult. Passively listening is pretty easy. But... <laughs> in, indeed. Indeed. So what wine are you enjoying these days? What's, what's interesting to you? Uh, do you even drink wine or is it like one of those things like – you, you spend all day with it. So when you go home, you have, uh, you know, whiskey or something else. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a big wine. Drink. The funny thing is right now I'm, I'm a cliche of a middle-aged man. I'm training for a triathlon. So I've, I've given up wine for two months and, uh, which is more than I haven't given up drinking for like an afternoon. So it's like <laughs> since I was 20. So it's really, really, it's it's crazy. It's a crazy discipline. And so I'm an expert on non-alcoholic beer. I would skip non-alcoholic wine completely. Um, I had a, a friend came over with a, a, chate, a bottle of Chateau Mossar. I don't know if you know Chateau Mossar, which is a Lebanese wine. Okay. So it's, it's really unusual. Uh, it's, it's really available in London. It's not so much available in the U.S. And um, it's great. It's made in the back of Valley, you know, which is, 
terrorists are shooting their guns. It's like unbelievable. And uh, so I had to have some of that just the other night. But Very cool. Um, no, but yeah, for the last two weeks, like for the next month, I'm not uh, really drinking wine. So will this be your first triathlon? I did one when I was 20. I did two when I was 20. So sort of, yeah, just seeing if you still got it. See, yeah, which I don't, but uh, see if I can still finish. <laughs> I, well, do you have a bottle planned for the finish? That's a good question. No, I don't have it planned, but there's lots of, uh, I'm looking at contenders. <laughs> What are what's on the short list? There's these old German uh, gold capsule wines that I haven't drank. It's like really have been waiting to open up this Auslesen, um, and it's, they have to be drunk sometime. Right, they probably go for another ten years, but they're they're from. 2003, 2005. So I was like, okay, I'm going to drink these now. Yeah. They're prime, primed and ready to go. Uh, yeah. That's one of those things I think of all the time. I'm guilty of it too. My stuff stored away from some special occasion. And I'm just like, well, what am I really waiting for? Like I should just open that when I really, when it's like a boring night. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make it exciting. So do you remember your last glass before uh, did you have anything special before you said okay I'm done drinking for two months I was like, you know actually there was a, it was a uh, some friends they get together they're a bunch of journalists and uh, there was a 1998 um, Chateau Le Grange which is a Saint Julien uh, Bordeaux wine which is fantastic it was 1998 and it was drinking perfectly and it was like it was out of a bunch of different ones that people brought to this. Um, I forgot what I brought, but um, it's probably something cheap and nasty. But uh, this that was a, it was a great wine, and it was just amazing. I was thinking, oh yeah, well, there we go. Two more months. <laughs> so you had that to hold on to, right? Yeah. No, I, and I had gone to a, a Austria the week before and uh, do some wine taste. It was. Fantastic. Um, Austria is great. Um, it's still it, for for really fine wine. Just the the price is incredible. I mean, it's just like I don't know how it is in Chicago, but um, the, the Gruner Veltlin or the best Pickler or um, Knoll or that's what maybe 60 60 bucks or 70 bucks compared to the best wines of any other really well-known region which would be like a thousand bucks so yeah it's one of those crazy things too I like working in the wine shop uh like gruner or like gewerstaminer those two especially are i forget who i was listening to some podcast and someone said uh do you know what gewerstaminer translates to uh, since unsellable, <laughs> so that's, right. that's perfect. Uh, well, Gewürztraminer is yeah, it's so unsexy. So if you want a Pinot Grigio or you want a Gewürztraminer, it's like yeah, exactly. It's not going to work on a date. But there's Riesling too. It's like that's not going to get you. People are like, oh, I don't want Riesling. Yeah, oh, it's too sweet. That's what you're open. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Was it the the flying nun or the blue nun? What was that? Blue nun, right? Yeah. Blue nun, yes. Things with which doesn't people. exist anymore. Yeah. Yes. Or they just like was, yeah, cherries the same way. It's like oh, it's all brown and sweet and weird and yeah. But I think it's it's also like secondhand knowledge. Like people are like that say that like oh, that's like oh, that's like that's like blue nun because they know that, but they probably never even had blue nun. They just heard that from someone. Yeah. And like, okay. I'm going to sound smart and say, <laughs> but there's a lot of that. Everyone wants to sound smart. Yeah, no, that's true. And so, yeah, like people say, Oh, I like a dry wine. Like that's what my mother says. I like a dry wine. And so 
and you, you give her something that's dry, she goes, mm. and so, and then she actually likes a sweet wine. So, <laughs> yeah, those are my favorites. I want, like, when someone walks in, I always call those the people who know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, like, someone will walk into the shop and they'll say, I want something dry, but not too sweet and like really really grippy tannins and you're like i i don't know where to go with this that's great yeah <laughs> just grab your tongue i don't know yeah you know it's like describing an album you're gonna listen to and it's like oh i don't know just gotta listen to it right it. yeah yeah i think there's been a lot of parallels to music uh in in talking to a lot of wine experts or people who are in the industry, uh, music comes up a lot. Uh, books was a great one. Uh, yeah, books is probably a better because a, a better metaphor because like because music can be consumed so quickly. Mm -hmm. You can just go 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 like go on Spotify and like go through different tracks really fast. So I don't like that, like that, like that. But you can't do that with wine. You can't do that with books. So that's probably more like it. I mean, it's slow. It's not made for this age, really. Wine. Yeah. Well, Steve, it was a real pleasure uh, chatting with you today. If people are interested in your grape varietal table and your maps and all your other resources and projects you're working on, what's the best way they can learn about those and get in touch with you? Well, you just go to um, DeLongWine.com. Is the beautiful, yeah. easy, one-stop shopping. There you go. <laughs> quick little update on Steve. I got to chat with him over email and he's getting set to launch a Kickstarter campaign for a box set of his wine maps of the world. He sent me a picture which is also up on the website and it looks awesome. So stay tuned. I'll announce that as soon as he lets me know that the campaign is live. Thanks for listening to my interview today with Steve DeLong. To learn more about Steve, head over to the roadtowineexpert.com. And while you're there, you can do two more things. First is you go to roadtowineexpert.com slash music. Wonder about the musicians who share their songs through the Creative Commons license and make podcasts like the Road to Wine Expert sound pretty awesome. The other thing you can do is go to roadtowineexpert.com slash 1000. That's slash and then the number one zero 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 because we've hit 1,000 downloads, which means I'm giving away $1,000 worth of wine, books, and resources, including some awesome maps and the tasting book that Steve has created. So head on over to roadtowineexpert.com slash 1,000 to find complete contest details about the giveaway. I'm Brian McCann. This has been the Road to Wine Expert podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.